Welcome to the week ahead. My name is Ibrahim Sani. We're broadcasting uh, live from the All Asia Broadcasting Centre here in Bukit Jalil, Kuala Lumpur. Now, this show has been taken, uh, taking a hiatus uh, over the past few weeks, uh, largely because I was unwell um, and I suffered from COVID. But, uh, you know, since we have since recovered, there's a lot of things that we need to unpack right now when it comes to what to expect from the week ahead moving forward. We're talking about the week of 21st of March all the way to 27th. Uh, but before we jump into the conversation of what to expect in the week ahead, we have to also look back at what has happened over the past week. Um, there's a few big things, just to recap. Um, not less because of the, um, uh, the landslide victory by AMNO in Johor, but that final twist at the end um, where the selection of the MB uh, was not made by the majority of the AMNO uh, lawmakers uh, in the State Assembly. Uh, in fact, Dato On Hafiz um, was um, speculatively uh, decided upon by the palace and the AMNO delegates uh, will follow uh, as per required, uh, the requirements set by uh, the palace. And because of that, um, there's uh, a low turnout from Johor uh, delegates at the uh, AMNO General Assembly that took place just a few days ago. Um, and of course, we have to also think about the election of AMNO uh, leadership that will take place uh, sometime November uh, this year. Um, and uh, this has to be done by December this year, the election, uh, based on some of the amendments that they have done uh, by the party election. Uh, sorry, party constitution. Um, there is also the conversation of how or when will a general uh, election be called. Not just the AMNO uh, uh, election to choose the AMNO leadership, but the general election as well. So there's a lot of things happening right now when it comes to AMNO. Um, when we talk about the AMNO leadership, general election, um, the ability for the Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri to call for an election, and what has transpired over the past week. So that's one area. Another area that took place last week is, of course, Rafizi Ramli announcing uh, his arrival or resurgence back into uh, the uh, leadership of uh, the ability for him to be a leader of PKR um, after being out of the uh, political scene over the past few years um, following the fallout uh, between him and some of the leaders inside PKR uh, he has since announced that he will contest for the number two post in PKR it's worth noting that in the PKR hierarchy right now there's a very um, clear vacancy at the top of the leadership of PKR. Uh, the former deputy president of PKR has left PKR, Azmin Ali, has left PKR uh, to join the uh, government coalition right now. Along with him are some of the leaders, including Zuraida and many others. Those are former leaders of PKR. So there's a lot of vacancy when it comes to the presidency, the vice presidency, um, the deputy presidency. Of course, all these areas uh, need to be looked at. So there's a lot of opportunities for the existing crop of PKR uh, to contest and to go for the number two or number three or number four post in the party. Um, and of course, uh, some of the uh, supporters of PKR is actually lauding this move uh, of the returning of the return of uh, Rafiz Ramli. Many others are basically questioning why is he making this move, considering that he has sworn off politics, so to speak, just a few years ago. So because of this, there's a lot of political. Uh, um, uh, temperature rising. There's also that whole Big Ten approach uh, when it comes to all the members of the opposition. All, yeah? I'm talking about um, Pejuang, uh, Bersatu, which is in some states, but of course, you know, need to be reminded that they are in the cabinet at the federal level. Um, of course, uh, Pakatan Harapan, uh, this include uh, their coalition partners of uh, Muda as well as Pejuang. Uh, on top of Amana and uh, DAP. So there's a lot of conversations that needs to take place over the next few weeks. Most notably, what will take place in the week ahead when it comes to the conversation of the uh, political alignment. So as you can see, plenty of things to offer, plenty of things to unpack. But for now, those are the kind of things that took place last week. Now, before we jump into what's coming up in the week ahead, we'll go for one short break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the week ahead.
Welcome back. This is the week ahead. My name is Ibrahim Sani. We're going uh, to you live uh, from uh, the All Asia Broadcasting Centre here in Bukit Jalil. This show covers some of the items that will take place over the next seven days. Um, there is a key uh, economic calendar that is going to take place um, on uh, Friday, March 25th. Uh, that's the uh, announcement of the inflation rate year on year as well as month on month for February. A lot of eyes are on this year's, uh, this month's inflation rate uh, because of the rising conflict tension that is currently happening in Ukraine and Russia uh, and because of the current uh, endemic status that the, current, the, the country might go through right now, uh, there's a lot of uh, po possibility of the inflation rate rising quite steadily uh, over the past one month. That is an area of concern and of course we want to hear more about the kind of items that is going to take place when it comes to the inflation rate. So over the next few days, uh, my colleagues um, over at Awanipagi, at Niaga Awani, Najib Arof and many others are going to be talking to a lot of uh, folks when it comes to uh, the uh, issue of inflation rate. Um, there's also that big announcement that was made by the Prime Minister last week when it comes to the EPF. Do check that out as well. Uh, that has basically answered the call from the many politicians that is uh, raising concerns on EPF withdrawal. But uh, as we all know, uh, the finance minister, Tukuz Afrul, did say uh, that because of the EPF withdrawal, um, there's some uh, reduction of the possible dividend that needs to be gotten. In fact, he was uh, mentioning in the parliament, it could have been as high as 6.7% dividend. But instead, because of the withdrawal, it uh, went down to 61 that was a kind of a strange statement to make, not because it is incorrect, it is factually correct, but because of how it came out, that it came out as insensitive uh, and that it came out as how it would be perceived as, uh, you know, uh, uh, lopsiding on those that have a lot of money inside EPF versus those that do not have. Whatever the PR conversation should be uh, when it comes to the statement that Tuguzafu said in the parliament, the matter of the fact is still there. Many of us do not have enough savings in EPF. In fact, um, when the dividend announcement came out, uh, the announcement that also came out with, uh, from the EPF was on the many Malaysians that do not have sufficient savings in account 1 and 2. Um, in fact, uh, there is also that whole long tail conversation of how people are surviving beyond 75. So even if you have enough when you uh, retire at the age of 55 or even 60, you might not necessarily have enough in your savings to keep on going uh, when it comes to uh, maintaining yourself well past the age of 75 or even 80 years old considering that Malaysian life expectancy is actually uh, increasing year on year. So those are the kind of items that we're looking at. Uh, there's also the kind of um, uh, trade uh, data that came in, uh, balance of trade that came in on uh, 18th of March um, and of course uh, retail sales figures uh, on March 14th. Those are happening uh, uh, at the end. But uh, one area that you can uh, keep an eye out for is of course the PPI index that is going to be announced on March 29th and of course the money supply that is going to be announced on March 31st. Those are the kind of uh, economic calendar that you can look forward to. Uh, but for now, uh, the other uh, date that you need to uh, be considering uh, when it comes to uh, the week ahead uh, next week is uh, some holidays uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, state holiday of Johor. Uh, so on the 23rd of March, uh, the Johor Sultan is celebrating his birthday. So there might be some um, uh, resulting uh, formation of the state assembly then. And perhaps those are the kind of ideas that we have to look at for the southern state of Johor. We'll go for one more short break. When we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more on the week ahead. Thanks for staying on with us. Uh, we need to also now look at uh, the um, endemic status that is taking place on the 1st of April for this year. Uh, the endemic status, even though 1st of April might not take place over the next seven days, but a lot of work is geared up towards it. Right now, the uh, total adult population that has taken a booster shot is about 66%. Um, for adolescent, they might be rolling out the booster shot program very soon, but no announcement as yet. But for adolescent, over 91% has taken or has completed two doses of vaccination. One problematic figure that needs to be discussed at length is, of course, uh, the 5 to 11-year-old um, uh, or pick kids, as they put it. Only 34% so far has taken the first dose. 
34% is a dismal number. That's basically one in three young Malaysians that have been given the first dose of the vaccine. This is not nearly enough for us to protect our young Malaysians. The uh, Minister of Health, YB Khairi Jamaluddin, has already spoken about this at length, about how we need to get parents to get their children vaccinated. But this is still not happening. And if you strip the data even further, northern states, particularly Kelantan, is registering so low the numbers. So for the folks in Kelantan, please ensure that you guys vaccinate your children in the week ahead because there will be a lot of rolling clinics that will be rolled out by the P uh, PPV, or in this case by the Ministry of Health, uh, to get to the areas where the children are highly uh, concentrated the most. There's also talks of this uh, vaccination being rolled out at schools as well. So those are the kind of areas that will take place over the week ahead. Before we end this show, um, I have done an interview uh, with Yayasan Peneraju uh, where I speak with uh, Dr. Amina Joseta Kayani, the uh, Director of Strategy there, um, at length about what it takes to close the gap between um, those that have and those that uh, do, the, 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 the number of people that are uh, needing jobs versus the number of jobs that is needed by the market. Uh, still a very long conversation to be had. Here's a snippet of my conversation with Dr. Amina of Yasa Panaraju. Take a look. Let's talk a little bit more about Yasa Panaraju. What do you guys do? Well, we actually are in the business of developing talent. So it's all about identifying what the market needs and developing programs so that we can churn out talent to fit those needs. Okay. I'm sure you don't work alone. You work with your partners. So we work with a team of 70 and uh, we generally work with a greater uh, ecosystem of talent builders in the market, in the government, industry, SMEs and all that. So we have lots of uh, collaborators. In Let's talk about the collaborators. What kind of sure. collaborators are you working with? Okay, for one, we have the uh, industry players. So that goes back to um, what the uh, market actually needs. So we have uh, identified the critical industries in which we want to actually place our talent. And then we also have the uh, civil service uh, society organizations. We have NGOs. We have, uh, of course, government agencies. And the, now we are moving into the global scene as well. So international, um, what they call it, collaborators as well. Okay, so when we talk about collaborators, um, to what extent are they working with you guys? Are they providing um, talent uh, placements? Are they working in terms of giving facility to, to you guys so that you can work with some of your scholars? How does it work? Okay, historically, I would say it was pretty linear. So we started off with the typical, typical tripartite relationship. So we, have, we are the funders. And we have the vendors who are either the academic institutions or the training partners, so they offer the programs. And then we have the scholars who are the beneficiaries from the program. But now it's grown beyond that, so we invite more with uh, a collaborative, collaborative partnerships where they come in and be like more of joint venture relationships with us. So we, uh, uh, we bring different kind of values to the table. Um, let me give you an example. So um, with uh, collaborative partnerships in terms of employment, we work directly with the last mile. So where the employment is, where the um, opportunities for jobs and um, gaining an income. So we identify which are the areas and we develop skill sets in those areas together collaborating with, with these partners where they actually either funnel with the um, uh, training partners itself because they know what kind of talent do they need, right? So they actually put in in terms of design, uh, development, the trainers and all that. And together, we will actually produce this talent which end up having a job at the end of the line. Okay, so we now know the role of the collaborators and the partners that you guys are building with. My question next, my next question is on how has the experiences been uh, with your partners when they work with the ASN Penuraju? Um, quite varied, I have to say. Um, it really depends on what kind of value they bring to the table. But the experiences are getting more colourful as we speak. Because as I said, historically, it's very, very straightforward, but now it's like multi-dimensional, the kind of value they bring to the table. And um, they have 
actually shown a lot of interest lately, especially with our ability to work with data and uh, decisions in which programs to actually invest in and design, develop has gone away from the typical, you know, one size fits all. So what we essentially try to do is we go closer to where the problem is. So for example, in certain geographical areas, certain states in Malaysia, they need talent to be developed in a particular field. So what we do is we actually go closer to the market, tie up with partners from those local um, states because they know what the problem is, what the problems are, and they also know how to actually address the um, specific demographics that we're looking at. And because we are doing that, it becomes a more customized program developed to suit the talent needs of the particular area that we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, what kind of opportunities do SM Praju open for collaborative partners when partnering? Could you name some partners? At least we get some ideas of what's happening. Okay, um, maybe I can take you around the country to see what we do with the partners. Mm -hmm. um, in the eastern states, uh, specifically Kelantan and Terengganu, we partner up with the state foundations, so Yayasan Terengganu, Yayasan Kelantan, and we actually leverage on their database of um, talent and B40 groups which need requ and require the, uh, the programs to upskill and reskill themselves, especially post pandemic. With the pandemic, they have lost their jobs or gone under employment or either that or basically are just unemployed after graduation. So what we essentially do is leverage on their um, know-how and intel to partner up and offer programs. The going south in Johor, for example, we are very proud of a very good partnership that we have stricken off with the Port Tanjung Pelepas. Um, the port, port industry is one of the most resilient throughout COVID. And We've seen how they actually are in demand of talent. It's just that not much of attention and traction is given over there. Mm. So what we did with them was essentially partner up in a, a JV kind of model and uh, develop pro uh, programs to churn out port planners and young engineers for the port. And they go through a, like an apprentice program, which takes about six to eight months and after which, upon successful completion, they land a job. So that's the partnership in Johor. And of course, we have, uh, we're growing into the Iskandar region and there's a lot of uh, demand for talent there as well. Moving up to the um, north, uh, we have partnerships with um, Kulim High Tech in the making, whereby we are actually funneling our assistance and ability to work with talent development strategically uh, to work hand in hand with the country's agenda to pull in foreign direct investment into areas like Kulim High Tech. Um, going to Sabah and Sarawak, we are working very closely with their talent because, of course, we really need to have really, really important to have local partners there. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to identify and get the buy in, right? So, identifying um, what do you call it, uh, talent demographics and uh, demand for talent from Yayasan Sabah in particular, Sabah Skills, and also the same for Sarawak. Okay, uh, on top of this, I'm pretty sure that there are more uh, in store in the pipeline. What mm -hmm. kind of partners are you uh, imagining or envisioning that you will be striking up next? Um, really, we are looking at working with partners who are able to join hands with us and to work more strategically with data and to come closer to closing that gap because i mean i'm going to sound like a broken record uh, but the industry academic um, gap and problem is real and it's still there so to close that gap we need partners to be able to bring us intel to say where is it that we need demand and we have to be able to look ahead instead of just being reactive to it so working with predictive analytics beyond what we are doing right now, just diagnostic and prescriptive. Because we are always treating the problem, but instead we should be able to anticipate where the gaps are in the future. And we, are, we want to work with partners who are able to do that with us so that we are ahead of time. You know, um, yeah, so essentially that to work 
yeah, more so strategically. With data. With data? What about so soft skills? What about the ability to collaborate with partners at the workplace? Oh, Those of kind course. of soft ideas. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's one of the um, strengths I would say Yaisan Tunraju has to, to actually couple up and package our solutions. When I say solutions, I'm referring to the programs to not only focus on the technical parts of it. So we always infuse it with the soft skills. Or I like to borrow the term smart skills from Asia Business School because it's so much as you know, when you're able to upskill, you're infusing the talent with um, technical know-how, right? Uh, all these certifications, you know, for example, robotics, you've got um, drone, you've got auto, uh, AutoCAD and all that, and IR 4.0, name it. But the thing is, with the ecosystem at work and even in business, we have to work with people. There's no running away from that. So soft skills is... It's just so, so important. And, and, and um, coming back to the term smart skills, it's something to be honed. And it will enable our talent, who is skilled with this technical know-how, to move in and to be adaptable and future-ready all the time. When I say future-ready, because the, the environment keeps changing, right? With technology, with the change of industry demand, customer preferences and all that. We've got a moving goalpost. And how do we keep sustainable how do we ensure that this talent will be adaptable right if they are able to actually develop that skill set the smart skills to be able to work with people critically uh, be um, good decision makers to be able to problem solve to actually be emotionally intelligent you know that is one of the by far the most important thing so people always say, you know, working with technology is easy, actually. Working with people isn't. Mm. So that part, we give emphasis. We call it the NDP at Yayasan Penaraju, Nurture and Development Program. So every single program that we offer, we infuse it, we package it with the soft skills, which we call NDP. All right. Um, it seems that much of what you're doing is institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, this is important in order for this uh, project or program to be replicatable. But how nimble are you or how dynamic is the program in order for it to uh, receive new input and further refine the program to be better in the future? Yeah, uh, uh, very, very uh, on point question there, Ibrahim. Um, as we speak, we are recognizing the need to work that way, you know, with all the skill sets that we are trying to build in the talent for the market we're doing it internally first. So what we're doing right now is revisiting and restructuring the organization to unlock the potential even more, to work nimble, you're right, absolutely there, agile, and to be adaptable to the current times. So of course, it I mean, it's like a given that every organization, the longer you are in existence, the more bureaucracy you have, right? So to unlock that, to review the business processes so that we are able to move fast forward faster but without compromising controls of course. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes people say it's easier to rip up the old playbook and start off with a, you know, with a new one because it has to be redefined according to the current ecosystem of work and essentially we are working close to that, close to that. Yeah, yes, I'm Raju. All right, that was our conversation with Dr. Amina Joseta Kayani, the Director of Strategy and Engagement at Yayasan Peneraju. Uh, you can watch the full episode that is going to be aired on March 23rd on Astro Awani at 10.30pm. Uh, over there, we're going to be talking at length about the kind of conversations that is being needed to be had when it comes to equipping Malaysian talent with the necessary skills that the market needs. That is taking place on March 23rd. Until then, thanks very much for watching. It's been a pleasure to be with you for this evening. Do take care of yourself. Uh, daily cases are rising. In fact, it needs to be reminded uh, that in Malaysia right now, uh, active cases is over 300,000 uh, cases. 300,000 patients right now are currently actively having COVID and being tested for it. Um, of which uh, about 222 or 0.1% is in ICU ventilated. About 154 or 0.1% is unventilated but still in ICU. 
Uh, but the key figure that we need to look at is not just the ICU ventilated, non-ventilated, and it's not about the home quarantine, which is constituting about 96-97%. It's the number of people being hospitalised. And right now, it sits at 8,000 people. 8,000 people are currently being hospitalised, and they are taking up the resources for the country. They need to be hospitalised because the cases are rising. We can do our part by reducing the number of cases, by taking the vaccine. If you haven't been boosted, take the booster shot. If you have a young child that has not been vaccinated, vaccinate him or her. They need the vaccination. I'm not too sure why you're holding up for that. Until then, thanks so much for watching. Catch you in the next one.